All right, why don't we, why don't we get into the Word of God tonight? Um, and uh, <laughs> we're talking about <laughs> the record of God. <laughs> the record of God. And I'm not talking about vinyl, okay? Uh, and, you know, what's really cool is that for a few years, nobody knew what vinyl was. But now vinyl's making a comeback, you know. And you, you remember going to the thrift store and getting vinyl for five cents of, uh, you know, five cents an album? Yeah. And now, have you seen what vinyl costs at Walmart? Thirty, forty, fifty dollars for a record? No kidding. Yeah. Uh huh. And then they put it on a machine and go, <laughs> and ugh. and so, <laughs> oh. I saw somebody advertising. Uh, advertising a, a, an old record player for sale uh, recently, and it said, just needs a needle. And I bet that the modern-day people buying these record players at Walmart and such don't even know how to replace a needle on a record player. Um, and they don't sell 45s. You guys know what a 45 is, right? Yeah, they don't sell 45s. They only sell albums. And when you start talking about 45, 45s and singles and stuff like that, because I remember when they'd put the single out on a 45 and you got the regular song, the song you were looking for on one side and on the other side was a song that didn't make it to the album and they just wanted to see if you'd listen to it, right? And uh, I don't know if that's the way it was when you grew up, but uh, that's how it was for me. I was at the end of the era of eight tracks. I know what they are, and my dad had a car that had an 8-track player in it, and, but I was at the beginning of the era of regular tapes, and, um, and so he, had, he, he got it just for me. He got one of those deals that would go in the 8-track player, and I could put my tapes in it, you know, because he had an old Lincoln town car, I think. It's what I learned how to drive in, um, was a Lincoln town car, uh, but... Uh, uh, I think maybe that's why I was able to drive a bigger truck whenever I got older, was because I learned how to drive in a boat. <laughs> so, uh, but and he even had upstairs at his house. My dad had a a big uh, a big uh, console stereo, you know, and it had it had a record player on it, and then the other side had an eight track player in it, and that sounded good. Sounded way better than most of the stuff they make today, because you know how many of y'all remember quality. And now they, well, it used to, back about 20 years ago, they started making things, 20, 30 years ago, they started making things to only last for seven years. Really, that's the way they design it, was to last seven years. And now I think they make it last until the warranty expires. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we were having a discussion the other day out in the parking lot about purchasing something for the church that it costs a lot of money and uh, and we were talking about how good of a warranty it come with and they're like well 30 days it's a 500 hundred dollar product comes with a 30-day warranty and you're like i'm like well at least it's not a taillight warranty you know that's just it's as good as it is until the taillights you can't see them anymore um but that's the way it is uh but let me get back to where we're actually going tonight the record of god um now that i got a little sidetracked there <laughs> Um, but here's the thing. God is interested in numbers. In fact, he is the ultimate accountant, and he keeps track of everything. We cannot fathom. Anybody know what an eidetic memory is? Or an eidetic memory. How, is, am I saying it correctly? I don't know. It's one of those memories that can remember everything that they ever have seen with great detail. They're the kind of people that can look at a page of a book and know everything it said because as soon as they saw it, their brain just remembers everything. And there's very few people that are out there that are, that are like that. Um, well, God knows everything before, it was, before he ever saw it because he saw it already. And we can't really understand how that works. Um, but, but God is interested in keeping record of things um, in Psalm 56, 8, it says this, You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God has kept track of every hardship and struggle that we have ever went through. He knows them. He has a record of everything that we've ever been through. Psalm 147, 4 says, He determines the number of the stars he gives to all of them their names. Now, I don't know, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, maybe in a Sunday morning service, but recently they've launched a new telescope into space. 
I think it's called the James Webb Telescope. I'm a little obsessed with telescopes. I think they're really cool. Um, I didn't know that my daughter-in-law had one, or we'd already be looking through it, because I don't own one, but I want one. And I don't, I don't want just a little tabletop telescope. We had a guy at our old church that had a telescope that was this big around, and it was longer than I am tall, and he had a whole, like, pullback thing. I've got to go look at a telescope once that was aimed straight at the sun, and I got to see the sun activity. I've got to look at Saturn and other planets and stuff like that. But uh, years ago, some of you may have heard of the Hubble telescope, right? I have friends with a guy uh, that his brother designed the coating that went on the lens of the Hubble telescope, and part of the design stuff came out of a town close to where I lived. But when they got it into space, they started seeing things they had never seen before out in outer space. And they saw stars that they didn't know existed. And so they, there was one little spot. There was a picture that the Hubble telescope took. And I wish I should have put this together. But there was a picture that the Hubble telescope took one time. And uh, there was a blank spot in the picture. And they were baffled because it was completely void of all stars. They couldn't see any stars or galaxies or anything inside. So there's this big picture, and in this one little spot, there was nothing. It was a void. They thought that it was just a blank space in space. So when they launched the James Webb Telescope here a year or whatever ago, um, they decided they wanted to take a look at that same spot again and see what they could find. And when they aimed the telescope at that one spot that was completely void of any stars or galaxies or anything, when they zoomed in to that one spot and they took the picture, they saw there was another set of countless galaxies and stars that they couldn't see before. And the more they point this thing in different places, they're seeing things that they were never able to see before in sharper images that they've ever been able to see before because they have a new lens, a new ability to see that far. We're just, we haven't even scratched the surface of the universe that God created. The scripture tells us that God knows, not only knows the number of stars, he's given every one of them a name. Sometimes we get a little bit worried about whether God knows what we're going through. You know, um, I, one of the things I love about Colorado is, uh, one, a lot of there's places where I can go and get really high off the ground. I'm still on the ground, but it's high up. They call them mountains. You, you ever been on one of those? And uh, I mean, the further you get away from town and you go out and you wait for about 30 minutes and your eyes can adjust to the complete darkness outside and you look up into the sky and you can see stars like you've never seen before. And uh, I've been able to experience that a few different times, but it wasn't until I moved to mountainous areas and I was really high in the air and in the complete darkness that I ever actually saw the dust of the Milky Way galaxy going across the sky. You ever, you ever been able to see that? I've seen pictures of it, and it was really cool, but once you see it in person, it's like, well, that's just amazing. Your eyes have to be open to see that. And we're just barely even understanding what stars, they think they know what stars are made of, and I say they think, because they haven't got a clue. They don't even know what's at the middle of the earth, but that's another sermon. Uh, they think they do, but they, do, they really don't know what's there. They don't know what stars are made of. They don't know what all is out there. Uh, and we're barely even scratching the surface of what could possibly even be out there. But God knows, and he knows everything about you. But here's what I want to talk to you about tonight. The record of God. Really, there's only two main points tonight, broken up into a couple of, of things that we're going to look at. The first one is this. There are things which God keeps record of. Um, if you've ever worked in an office, you know there are things that you have to keep record of 
And there are things that you do not need to keep record of. And then there's things you don't want to keep record of. <laughs> but, but sometimes you have to figure out what category that they fit in. I, as a manager of the welding supply store, I had a list of items. There was things that were lifetime. You had to keep them for the life of the, the store. And even if the store closed, they had to store them somewhere uh, just in case. Then there was things that were 10 years and 7 years and 5 years and 3 years. And our DOT stuff was 12 months plus current and we were not allowed to have past the 12 months plus current and if one of our safety guys came in and found us with 13 or 14 months we would get written up because they didn't want us to have that excess stuff they wanted the record to be gone and that's something important to understand there are things that need to be recorded and there are things that need to be done away with and so the, the two main points tonight are there are things which God keeps record of, and the second one is there are things which God keeps no record of or strikes them from the record. These are two important things to understand. So let's take a look at a few things that God does keep record of. We're not going to read the entire book of Numbers or Acts. That's why I didn't even give them the scriptures, so we're just going to kind of talk about these things. Um, but... One of the things that God keeps record of is the number of his people. There's an entire book named after numbering his people. He knows who you are. He knows that you're a child of God. And he knows, he knows who you are. He knows if you're a child of God or not. Okay? He knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart. He knows if you know him. And he knows you whether you know him or not. He knows you whether you serve him or not. He knows everything about you, every intimate detail to the very cellular structure of your body. He knows it all. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. He knows what you did yesterday. Whether that's good or bad, he knows. Okay? He knows everything. And he keeps a record of all those that are his. The record of all those that are his, does anybody have an idea what that might be called? It's a, it's a book. The book of life. The book of life are those that are recorded in a book that will enter into eternity with Christ. Those are his and he has you numbered. The second thing here. Um, is the people who are added to the total. What, what do you mean? Now, if you're showing up on Wednesday nights, you might know that we're going through the book of Acts, and I've titled it The Beginning of the Church, and it's really important. How many people started the church? I know this isn't my typical yelling and screaming sermon. How many people were there? The, the, how many people started the church? 120. There were 120 that were still there in the upper room the day that the Holy Spirit fell. How many people were in the church by the end of the day? 3,120-ish, <laughs> okay? Uh, and, and so uh, there were 3,000 people that got saved when pre Peter preached his first sermon, I, I've been trying to figure out how to preach like Peter did for a very long time, right? And when I look at the sermons that Peter preached, they're not nearly as nice as the ones that I preach. You know, I think that maybe, maybe I'm doing it wrong. I don't know. He's like, you that killed Christ and put him on the cross, you evil people. You're terrible and, and it's all your fault, but you were dumb and didn't know what you were doing. And now you need to repent. I mean, that's really, like, if we were going to do, like, a four-point sermon, you know, you could do that. It'd be like, you did it. It's all your fault. Repent. <laughs> I guess that's a three-point sermon right there, right? And, and that's the way he preached, and people got saved. You know, we, we want to get people saved with some uh, feel-goods and hugs, and, and feel-goods and hugs are important. But people need to understand that in order to be counted with the number and be added to the number, there has to be a repentance of sin, Right? Because God knows when you have sinned. 
And sin is what separates us from God. Well, we'll get to some more of that. But the book of Acts, there's a few different times where we get some numbers, like the 3,000 that were added on that day. God knows when a new person is added. The angels in heaven rejoice when a new person is added. I would love to see a whole lot more people getting saved in our church. But the really crazy thing is, is to see people getting saved in church means that unsaved people have to come to church. So we can't expect saved people to come to church and get saved. Because usually if they're saved people, there's one of two reasons they're coming to our church. One of them is because they moved here from another area. And the other is because they moved here from another church. Okay? And everybody's welcome and we'll just invite everybody to come and hang out and stay with us. But saved people are not what we're needing. We need people that don't know Jesus to get saved to add to the number. Because if you're already saved, you're already added to the number. We've already counted you. Let's not make him count you twice. So then there's one other thing, and there's lots of other things, but I'm trying to keep it short and, and sweet tonight, and because um, this morning was really long. It was longer than I planned, but I didn't preach that long. Really, I didn't. It just didn't start until late. Um, but, uh, but I'm trying to keep things a little shorter tonight. So, so the third thing under things that God keeps record of is this. Any labor of love and work of faith. Any labor of love and work of faith. In Hebrews 6, verse 10, it says this. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. God keeps a record of the good things that you do. You remember what Jesus said whenever they asked him, how, when was it that we fed you? When was it that we clothed you? When was it that we took care of you? And he said, whatever you do, to the best of the best? Is it how you treat those that have come in and they've got all the money and the good stuff? Mm -mm, that's not what it says. It says, Whatever you do to the least of these, you've done to me also. How we treat people is wonderful. I, I, I've shared a story before about my, uh, I got invited to go to a, uh, a, a Mormon event, right? I went to, it was, uh, they called it uh, multi-stake devotional, is what it called. Uh, and... They had the, the second in command of all of the Mormon church. The president apostle was speaking there. He came, he was wheeled in like a, he was the president of the United States. Came in and, and actual into the, we had a dome stadium down there in the teeny tiny town that we lived in. Had an actual domed football stadium that was owned by the high school. And they brought him in in an armored SUV. And he got out and he came up onto the stage like the Pope, waving at everybody he spoke his devotional thing that he gave, and then he got back into his SUV with all his security. And, I mean, it looked like the president with the, you know, things coming out of their ears and put them back in there and, and drove off. It's really neat. But I was there. I was a guest, and, and I got invited, and I was one of the few pastors. Actually, I think it was the only pastors, what they said, that had ever shown up to one of their events. And I, they invited me, so I went, and I showed up, wanted to see what it was, and that's another story. But they grabbed me and they put me in the front row. They created a new front row. Like there was people sitting in the front row, so they put chairs in front of them and, made, and did it just so that I could come sit in the front row because I was a pastor and they wanted to show me off because I had shown up because I was a prominent member of the community and all this and they wanted to say, look at what we have done. We got this big wig to come in here. And that's not what we're called to do. It's not. There's nothing wrong with honoring people where honor is due. But if we're going to call someone up to give them honor, shouldn't it be the least of these? Because isn't that what Jesus said? 
If we're going to provide for somebody, shouldn't it be providing for those that are hurting and in need? Because that's what Jesus keeps the record of. Not, not just honoring those that, that have done great things or to show off, but honoring those that nobody else would look at. Because if you remember in this story, there was a story uh, that's actually talking about salvation when there was a big feast made by the king and all of these people were supposed to come and they said, oh, well, we can't make it because the Super Bowl's on or whatever. I mean, you know, okay, that's not really what the Bible says, but it's something like that, right? There's other important events going on and we can't make it. And so the king says, go to the highways and byways and invite those that are just walking by and bring them in to a feast. And these people got to come and feast like they've never been able to feast before. Something to think about. What is the record that God keeps? He knows who his people are. He knows who's being added to his kingdom. And he knows if we are doing acts of love and mercy and grace to those people that others just wouldn't even have to do with. Something that God keeps a record of. What are some things that God does not keep a record of? Well, these things are important, but they also, I think, come with some conditions. Failures in our life. Anybody in here ever made a mistake? Anybody in here made a mistake in the past hour? <sighs> Psalm 103.10 says, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Now, wait a minute. I thought that if we were sinners, we'd get cast into hell. I thought that if, if we didn't know Jesus, that we didn't make it. Well, how many of us can do enough good things to make our sin go away? Nobody's raising their hand. What makes our sin go away? Well, the blood of Jesus Christ that covers our sins. There, if we were judged according to our actions, how many of us would be able to stand before God? None of us. Only through the blood of Jesus. So God doesn't keep a record of our sins when they're covered by the blood of Jesus, which is the second thing that I have on here. He, doesn't, he does not uh, 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 keep track of the failures and the mistakes in our lives, but He does not sins which have been forgiven. He does not record them. They're not on His list anymore. That doesn't mean that he absolutely forgets them because he's God and he can't forget anything. But there's something really nifty about Psalms 103 verse 12. It says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Now, I don't know how far the east is from the west, but I know that you can keep going and you never get there. Casting Crown sings a song, you know, about the, as far as the east is from the west. And how, how far is the east from the west? It's from one outstretched hand to the other. That's how much Jesus loved us. All of those sins were nailed to the cross for us. And so, sin that's been forgiven, and that's important. And, I don't know if you're kept keeping track of what's going on here, but the third one is so very important because it's the same thing. The terrible things we've done in our lives before turning to Him. Now what about the things that we've done after we've turned to Him? Well, those are things that you've got to keep asking for forgiveness of. But folks, I, I don't want to be judged by the sins of my past. Isaiah 44, 22 says this, I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me for I have redeemed you. Our redemption is in the blood of Jesus. It covers our sins. It covers all of our sins in the past. It will cover the sins that we ask for forgiveness. If we make a mistake and we go before the Lord and we ask for forgiveness... He is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins. And, uh, and I'm not quoting that correctly. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me get my brain going right. I didn't have that one up on the wall. That was fresh out of the mind. Um, 1 John 1, 9. He's faithful to let it all go. But here's something that's really important. If we don't forgive others, he doesn't forgive us. It's, it's hard to, to think about for just a second, but think about that. You know, we're really good, if we don't know somebody, to not hold their past against them. Aren't we? You know, somebody comes in fresh off the street, and we don't know them, and we're like, oh, it doesn't matter what you've done. Oh, you robbed a bank. That's okay. You're probably going to go to prison because the world's going to do that to you. But we're going to forgive you, and Jesus will wash it clean. And, and oh, we're, oh, it's so amazing. But if it's somebody that we know, especially somebody that we go to church with, and they do something wrong, and they need forgiveness, well, you know you hurt me. Yeah, and I'm just not real sure if I can let this go. I mean, you made fun of the shirt I was wearing last week, and that was pretty hurtful. You know, what's really good is if the pastor doesn't shake your hand. Well, I don't know if I can like that pastor. He didn't shake my hand. He just walked right past me. Didn't even say hi or boo or nothing. Was he busy? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I, he didn't talk to me. Pastor didn't remember my name. That was one of my favorite ones ever. Pastor didn't remember my name. If you were here when I first got here, I told you before you even had an election that the, one of the worst pastor qualities that I think I have is the ability to remember things, especially names. I'm so bad at remembering names. I would prefer, what would be really great is if every person that walked in the door of the church there was one of those little name tag thingies and just whack, stuck it on your chest and walked around and then you could just walk and you don't have to go oh hey brother and sister we're glad you're here <clears throat> but we need to begin to forgive other people because if God can forgive us, we've done way worse to him than anyone's ever done to us. You know, I shared a little bit of stuff this morning, but one of the things that I really have has been weighing on my heart lately is just how bad of a person I used to be. And it's not been weighing on my heart like, like, oh, I'm beating myself up about it. But it's been weighing on my heart that we run into people all the time that are pretty rough people. And I think about the people that didn't give up praying for me, even though I was being really stupid. Anybody in here ever been really stupid? Nobody wants to raise their hand. There's a couple of people that are like, yep, still stupid. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I should be good. Uh, but we, but, but and a lot of us as Christians, we've made some really bad mistakes, and aren't we glad that God doesn't hold it against us? You know? And, and we've got to quit just looking at people that we don't know and be able to forgive them. We've got to look at people that have hurt us and let it go. And there are some very extreme circumstances where, yeah, you've got to sever a relationship, and you've got to be able to forgive them and just move on, but you can't have them in your life. But those are really extreme circumstances. You know, they stole my parking spot, or they said a mean thing to me one time, is not really the best reason to hold a grudge. Because you know, we haven't, we haven't done the study, but maybe we'll do it. We're, the rumor's floating around, and I don't know where it came from, but uh, probably because there's people talking about it, that we might do small groups at some point in time. Um, but, you know, 
there's a book called The Bait of Satan. Anybody in here ever read The Bait of Satan book? Uh, oh, now we're going to do it. Okay, it's just going to happen. We're going to have to do The Bait of Satan. The Bait of Satan, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you the end of the book, okay? The Bait of Satan is offense. Not offense. Being offended. You get offended. Somebody does something to you. They cut you off in traffic. <laughs> they said something mean to you at church. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, they've offended you. You get offended. And then bitterness begins to root into your life. And that bitterness leads to unforgiveness. And it leads to anger. And it leads to malice. And then when you see them again the next time, you're like, that person did this to me. And it was probably something small. I love using this thing about talking about people in traffic cutting somebody off. You ever got really mad at somebody that cut you off in traffic and never saw them again in your life? Every single time someone cuts you off in traffic? And then you say things like, People out here, they're just the dumbest people in the world. They need to learn how to drive, right? I mean, I know you would never say anything like that, but I would. And, uh, and you get all red-faced, and you're shouting and slamming the steering wheel and all that. All the while, they're driving away, and they probably didn't even realize that they had done it. And then the next day, you cut somebody off in traffic. You know, it's an accident, and you're like waving at them like, oh, I'm sorry. And then, you know, they're slamming the steering wheel, and you don't even know it. You're just driving on with your day. Maybe we need to quit getting mad because we got cut off in life and get over it. Because you know who's mad for the rest of the day when you get cut off? You. Not the other person. They moved on from it about 20 seconds after they did it. And they're hoping you're going to forgive them. And we get real bitter. And they say, well, what in the world does that have to do with anything? You know, God doesn't record, doesn't keep record of the sins that we ask for forgiveness of. Why in the world do we need to keep record all day long, every day, of the little things that people have done to us in our life, and even if they're big things? Just give them to God. These really nifty benches we have up here, we call them altars. You know what altars were for in the Old Testament? They were big stone things, right? And they had fire and all this, and they sacrificed animals on them for sins of people and the nation of Israel. There was blood and guts and nasty and all the junk that went. And I'm, you know, we come to church and we want to smell good in here. But when you went to the temple, the temple probably didn't smell too super great. There was a reason why God had incense burning. And folks, we walk in the door and we can have on the best perfume or the nicest cologne, wearing all the clothes that look good, the, the coolest Bethel t-shirt that's ever been designed. You can have it all. But the stench of our sin and our bitterness needs to be taken to the altar and burned at the altar. We need to quit keeping record of it. Why don't we start recording the things that God records? Let's keep track of the people of God and love them and build them up. Let's keep track of the people that we're adding to the kingdom of God and what we can do to add more people to the kingdom of God. Let's keep track of the good and awesome things and think on these things of God. And let us start wiping away the bitterness of sin and, and unforgiveness and the anger that comes from all of that because it does nothing but ruin your day and ruin your life. And if bitterness and unforgiveness rules your life at the end of the day or at the end of your life, eternity will be destroyed for you because you couldn't let go. I don't know. Seems kind of important to me. Maybe, just maybe. We need to start allowing the mind of God to penetrate our minds and record the awesome things of God. Record the awesome things that He has for us in our life. And let go 
of the things that he lets go of. So to think about it for just a moment. In the areas of your faithfulness, he remembers. In the times that you're hurting, he remembers. But the areas of our failures and our sins, when we turn to him, he forgets. Do you have anything in your life that you just need to let go? Is there something someone's done to maybe hurt you? Or you just haven't, just haven't given it to God and let it be destroyed. If you want to come down to the altar, you can in just a moment, but I'm going to pray. Why don't we just, everybody bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. I don't want anybody looking around. It's just between you and God and me. And I'm up here too. You say, Pastor, I love the Lord with all my heart. But there has been some bitterness, whether it's something small or something big, or maybe a bunch of somethings. I need to let it go. And I want to wash it away. And I want the Lord to wash away this bitterness from my life and this hurt and this heartache that I went through. Nobody's looking around. If that's you, just raise your hand. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to stick you out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to call you up to the altar because I just said I don't want to point you out. But it's time for you to just give it to God. In the next few moments, I'm going to pray and we're going to dismiss the service. If you'd like for me to pray for you individually or you'd like to come to the altar, you can feel free to do that here at the end of service. But I want you to just take a moment. You raised your hand, or even if you just didn't want to raise your hand, you didn't, you, you didn't want other people to see that thing in your life. You need to give it to God. Let it go right now. Lord, we just love you and praise you. We need you so desperately. What I pray tonight, that our minds would be focused on the things that are important to you. The things that you remember. The things that drive you and are passionate to you. Being the church. Building the church. Loving people living for you, these important things. And God, you saw the hands and you saw the hearts that were raised to you tonight. Of those of us, and I, I'm in the same boat. Lord, you know my heart. You know the anger that gets me and the hurt and the heartaches. And you know every hurt and heartache and every root of bitterness that has hit every person in this room. So Lord, in these moments, I give you my, I give you my bitterness, I give you my hurt, my heartaches. And Lord, those that are here tonight that are lifting those to you, Lord, I pray that you would help us to overcome. You've called us to be overcomers. Lord, let us in our weakness see your strength, live out in our life to overcome these bitterness things that have latched on to us and caused heartaches, God. Let us feel the weight just lifted from our shoulders and the strength of your righteousness to build us. Lord, I just pray all of this in the precious, amazing name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you.